Alrighty guys, in the previous episode of our journey of going from a complete noob to a veteran ASM coder, we uh, talked about the first five chapters of the thread of how to make your own cheat codes. Basic requirements before starting this, uh, installation of Dolphin in the live RAM viewer, some overview of Dolphin and different tabs slash panels that you will be using forever when you are a code creator. Um, overview of the live RAM viewer, checking it out a bit, and also viewing and checking out the ASM WeRD ASM compiler. All right, so now we're going to go into chapter six, Power PC Assembly. It says before continuing any further in this guide. <clears throat> you must learn PowerPC assembly language. There's no way around it. I've actually talked to a few people that somehow think they can make ASM codes without learning assembly language. Um, you're going to have to learn it. If you're not willing to learn it, then you're never going to be able to make ASM codes. Um, period. Uh, when you read the thread I'm about to link, you must actually read the thread. Don't be impatient and skim through just looking for things that catch your eye. You have to buckle down and take the time to read everything. Again, you must actually read the thread, word for word, every paragraph. No letter left behind. You cannot just skip a chapter because it doesn't look like, it just doesn't catch your attention right away or you just don't want to skip a second half of a chapter because you think it's not important or you think you already learned enough. You cannot do that. You must read the entire thread. I cannot stress that enough. All right, so let's click the link and begin. Okay, so obviously this tutorial will teach you how to read and write basic. Now keep in mind, basic PowerPC assembly language. Very basic. Just enough so you can make a couple of your first codes. I mean, assembly can actually get complex. For the most part, most MKWE codes are actually really simple. They might look, look complex, but all the instructions that they're executing is very basic. Very basic math, very basic goals, if you will. Okay, so we already know blah, 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 blah. We know Broadway is the name of the CPU, etc. Okay, register. What is a register? Okay, well first let's bring up the registers tab and take a look at it alongside with when we're reading. Let me move this up here, click the Registers tab, and we'll view up here. Okay, there are all types of registers. Okay, so a register is an accessible location of Broadway. Okay, now remember we talked about the memory portion of the game? Um, where you will have things, like remember I told you in dynamic memory, you can have various stuff stored there, read from there, loaded from there, right? That's on the game portion, but on the CPU side of things, we have the registers, right? So at the registers, you can have various data be loaded there, stored there, utilized there, all sorts of different things. So the game has the memory, and Broadway has the CPU. The goal of ASM is to get Broadway to interact with memory via various ASM instructions, okay? So... There's all sorts of registers, as you can see. A lot of these you will never use, first of all. So what do we need to be concerned with as a beginner code creator? We need to be concerned with the 32 normal integer registers. These are called the general purpose registers or the GPRs for short. I would say about 90 to 95 percent of MKWE codes only use the GPRs. This is what I mean that by MKWE codes aren't really that complex at all. So what are the GPRs? Well, you see these registers on the far left right here? R0 through R31, those are the GPRs. Um, we'll cover over some quick ones really quick. These F0 to F31, <clears throat> that's for floating points. Um, this PC, program counter, that's the memory address of what instruction you are currently on that is being executed. Um, LR stands for link register, is used for creating subroutines. CTR right here, that's for creating like loops and stuff like that. Everything else, don't even worry about. I'm already overwhelming you enough. There's a lot of data and information to take in at once. Okay, so we'll 
put that out of the way, get a sip of water, let you digest all that information. Just keep in mind that the goal of ASM codes is to get the CPU to do various things to affect memory. Okay. And uh, you can do vice versa. Okay, so going back, data within registers. Okay, so back in the chapter, I mean episode two, excuse me, I told you that compiled form of codes in memory are in hexadecimal. Same rule applies to registers. All these values you see are in hexadecimal. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, in episode two, we talked about words, half words, and bytes. Same thing. So let's look at, see this register right here? Register 12. Let's just copy paste its value. Um, some coders, when they name registers, they'll say like R6 or R20 or R31. Some will say register 6, register 30, register 2 or something. It just depends on who the coder is. Whichever one is easier for you, just say it how you want to say it. It doesn't matter. So we took, um, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention with this little registers tab, a little FYI, you can double click in here and just copy. Easy to do, right? We're going to paste this. So this is the value of register 12, the entire value. Um, obviously, with the general purpose registers, they are all a word in length. Um, with other registers like floating points and certain other ones, they're way longer than a word in length. Okay, so just the FYI, but we're just going to worry about the general purpose registers. We're not even going to mention any other registers for the rest of this video. Okay, so if you've been following along, you've been doing all the uh, video watching, you've been following all the tutorials, doing your homework and whatnot, we know that this value is a word. So if I was to say uh, the word of register 12, this would be the word of register 12, the entire data, all the data of register 12. Now here's where things get a little different. Remember, uh, let's pretend just for a second that this was a compiled instruction in memory. If you found this instruction in memory address and I told you the half word, you would highlight the first half. And if I told you the byte, it would be this. It's the reverse in registers. If I was to say, what is the half word of register 12? This value, 2720. If I was to say the byte of register 12, it would just be 20. Keep that in mind. So when a coder says, uh, well, what's the byte of that register? Or you, hey, uh, or you have a, a, like trouble with something and the uh, code creator says, well, just take the byte and store it. Don't store the word or something like that. You'll understand these terms later. When, they, when they're saying byte, all I'm trying to get you guys to understand is they mean this portion. When they're saying half word, they mean this. And when they say word, they mean that. Okay. So going back to that, now that you understand a byte of a register, a half word, and a word. Okay. Intro to instructions and compiler basics. So obviously when you write in a compiler you just can't type it or write it out however you want. There's certain symbols, certain, way, certain ways you gotta organize instructions or else you'll get a compiler error. So list of symbols, we have periods, colons, commas, parentheses. I put a list of all the symbols that are the most used. The most used symbol of all of these is gonna be your comma. Parentheses are used quite a bit. Um, so is the X thing that's representing for hex values and whatnot. Okay, so now we have a little note about hex versus decimal. When you write instructions, you could actually write them in decimal. And when they get put into compiled bytecode, the compiler will automatically put them in hex form. What I recommend is that if you're working with values, like small values, like one, two, 25, 50, or 11, you can use decimal. Anything else beyond, or if we're talking about values of memory addresses, or an entire word of values, highly recommend you stick to hexadecimal. Okay, just to keep things easy. All right, move on to the next chapter. Format for writing instructions. This is really important. So, we'll go here. All right, so we'll just leave this here. Any GPR, general purpose register, is RX. Obviously, you already know this. Look at the registers. R0 to R31. So R12 would be this. So when you write register 12 into compiler, 
you don't actually type out register space 12 you just put lowercase r then 12 now you cannot use this in hex form so you cannot change this to c in hex whenever you're writing registers like this you use decimal form so yes i know it's confusing going back and forth with hex and decimal but trust me when you're working with large various integer values when you're writing instructions coming up you really want to stick to hexadecimal especially when we're talking about referencing or putting memory address values in instructions just, I would not want to deal with decimal not at all okay so if I was to say like alright let's back step a bit so that's how you would type R12 R0 register 0 R31 register 31 easy enough I guess we can just take this out now here is the basic format um so the basic formats like this register 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 okay uh, we'll talk about a different format here in a little bit but codes will follow a format like this now what is RD RD is the destination register and these two other registers are source registers basically now this is all very general we'll cover actual instructions here in a bit just going over just a very very general format a view of the format of how you type instructions in the compiler these source registers the values in here so because if you look at dolphin these are values that represent each register right so the values in RA and RB will calculate or compute what will be put in RD does that make sense okay so um, pretty basic there's really not much more I can cover in this is this is just a general format okay um, another general format the other kind is really just basically two kinds I'm talking about basic instructions is this now we can tell that you sure you know RD destination register are a source register now what the heck is this value now this is a little different this format will take what's an RA in a value not nothing in a register just a value treat it like written from scratch if you will it takes these two items computes the result for the destination register now what is value? Well value is any 16-bit, so a half word, you should know what 16-bit is already, signed or logical decimal or hex value. You can write them in hex, you can write them in decimal. So this is what I was talking about earlier. I was really referencing this value right here. When you write the value for value, <clears throat> if it's a small number, stick the decimal. If it's a big number, or it's something like a memory address, like some portion of memory address, hexadecimal. Can't stress that enough. Okay, so what is sign? What is logical? So first off, first off, when I'm typing anything, because we're always typing in hex, you notice how in the beginning I would type an address like this? But when you get into your coding, you want to put a zero x in front of it just so you always know that represents hexadecimal this this little thing won't affect the actual value it's just compilers everything has been configured on planet earth to know that when you put a zero x in front of something it's hexadecimal the registers tab in here on dolphin does not do it because it would waste a lot of space just an fyi but obviously all the register values are in hexadecimal okay so we know that a value, the word, a, a, a general purpose register is a word in length. If you are paying attention and you know the rules of hexadecimal, we should already know what hexadecimal is, we know a register can be this range, all zeros to all f. All right, pretty simple. Now, these numbers can, can is a key word, be logical or signed and it all depends on what instruction you are using every different power PC instruction has different rules for this little value uh, guy right here sometimes this value will be signed sometimes it will be logical now what is signed what is logical signed means that negative numbers are possible that's all it means logical means no there are no negative numbers all values are positive okay 
So if we're working with the instruction that treats value as sign, and, we have, and we're working with this range in a general purpose register, what values are negative, what values are positive? So things get a little different because remember I said this value is 16-bit or whatnot? Therefore, we are working with a, a little bit different rules per se. But before we get into those different rules, we'll just cover the entire register value that when you're working with sign, let me just change this. If we're talking about entire length of data and registers, not going to worry about this 16 bit thing for now, but just generally speaking, this right here is negative. These are negatives. So imagine it like this. Uh, no, we'll leave it like that. But we'll just leave it like this. Negative, positive. Now, if we were to convert these to decimal, now it, this is assuming the value is sign. That's negative one. That's negative two. And it goes all the way down. So eight all zeros is actually the the lowest, if you will, negative number. All right, and then this would obviously be the biggest positive number. Let's scroll down. Cameron has a good little thing about this. Here, visual analogy. Say he puts the green positive, zero less than or greater than to the seven all Fs, and then greater than all that to negative or less than FFF all negative, excuse me. So this right here, go down to his post. If you're a little confused what I'm talking about, <clears throat> that's a great representation of what the range of positive and negative values are if they're sign. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, what, if, what happens if they're logical? They're all positive. Zero would be zero. If you convert it to decimal, and this would be big ass number if you will okay so now that we got that out of the way let's go back to this format sorry guys that took a while but it's really crucial you understand sign and logical most instructions will be signed FYI most will so when we're talking about value remember this is 16 bit this is a half word okay the range on value if it's sign so if it's sign the range on value is this. That's the range. And I know it seems a little confusing, but for PowerPC to make this little 16-bit thing work for sign values when you're writing hex, <clears throat> this is called sign extension. It just adds a bunch of, bunch of Fs. So remember how 8 all zeros was the lowest negative number? Well, we're talking about you know an entire word of a register, but when we're just talking about half words, see how this makes sense? Eight zero zero zero. So that's the range you would use for value if it's sign. So if it's not sign, if it's logical, you can use the full range of half words. It doesn't matter. But like I said, most instructions are signed. So I'm sorry if this is a little confusing. It can be. Uh, you can use Cameron's analogy or little visual analogy to help you out. So see, ASM is already really tough to learn off the bat just by getting just random values down. Okay. Take a small break. A sip of water. Now let's actually dive into real ASM instructions. We're going to start with the most basic instructions. They're known as integer ASM instructions. We've already gone over the registers. We've gone over various values, signed, logical. Uh, I showed you a list of symbols that would be used. Obviously you can tell in the format. See these commas right here. They're, they're used for general formatting and whatnot. So now let's go over actual 
representation. Uh, I mean, actual instructions. And by the way, you don't need uh, spaces in here. It depends on like when you're writing instructions, if you want spaces or not. Me, I like spaces. Okay, so now we got that out of the way. Let's talk about a really simple ASM instruction. Add. What does this do? Well, it's an addition instruction, obviously. So, the value in RA is added to the value in RB, and whatever the, the value is that's computed there will be placed into RD. Now, it's critical to understand that whatever was in RD beforehand doesn't matter. It gets wiped completely. All right? So, let's type out an actual ASM instruction like this. So the value of R4 with the value of R25, whatever that equals, will replace and be put in to R20. So what I'm going to do to represent that is I'm going to open up my own little compiler, the one I like Python, and we're going to type this out in here. I guess we can use the compiler here. I like to use this because I get a raw ASM format. I'm just using this for the purpose of showing you what happens in Dolphin. Because I get a lot of, because there's really no point in making all these video series if I don't give you a visual representation of what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some really quick thing, uh, quick modifications of Dolphin. Don't worry about any of this for now. I just want to show you. Okay, so <clears throat> this instruction, you can see highlighted in the code view, add R20, comma, R4, comma, R25. Value in R4 plus value in R25 will be placed in the R20. So check this out. I'm going to put the value of 2 in R4, okay? And we go scroll down here. I'm going to put the value of 3 in R25. You got that? I put 2 in register 4. I'll put the value of 3 and register 25. Now I want you to take a look at this guy right here, R20, once I just execute this one instruction. Okay, watch carefully. You see that? R20 equals 5. Why is that? Well, obviously, 2 plus 3 equals 5. Okay? Now let's go back to our tutorial. Now, you see, see it on my tutorial says, imagine this as a basic math equation. 2 plus 3 equals 5. Now, what do you know about addition way back in the day when you taught it? You can swap the 2 and the 3. 2 plus 3 equals 5. 3 plus 2 equals 5. So if I wrote that as this, it will do the same thing. Okay? Easy to, easy to understand? Now, let's go to the next instruction. You would learn how to do some basic adding. Let's talk about add immediate. Now add immediate has this format signed. Okay, it's really crucial to understand <clears throat> that this value is signed. As I said, most stuff is signed. So let's go over a real world example. But this time, we're not going to use decimal. We can represent hex. And the reason why I do this is to show you how to write instructions when you're using hex for the, the value. you got to put that 0x in front of it, or the compiler is not going to know it's hex. Right? All right. OK, cool. So this is a little bit similar to the previous instruction. But instead, we do this. We take the value in R30 plus the hex value is C and put in R4. Let's uh, put that, let's copy paste this. I'm going to put in my handy dandy Python compiler. Now I just want to show you how this instruction executes. Okay. We'll go to registers. All right. <clears throat> so, as you can see in Dolphin, when I plugged it in, it put it to its decimal form because C equals 12. No big deal, but you know it's the hex value of C. 
we're going to take put a 1 in R30. Now check this out. I'm going to put all F's in R4. Remember I told you with this add instruction whatever value is in the destination register is going to get wiped. doesn't matter what it is beforehand. So we got value 1 in R30 and we're just adding 12 to it or hex amount of C. Now take a look at R4. Boom, changes to D, because C plus 1 equals D. Okay, makes sense. See how the, the, the rest of the F's are completely wiped out? So whatever was in R4 beforehand just gets trashed, it gets erased. Put into oblivion. Okay. Now there's, now you can do like negative. So instead of writing 12, you can do negative 12. Uh, it just adds negative 12. Pretty simple to do. Easy math. But we have things called simplified mnemonics. Um, instructions have a term of standard mnemonics, but we have these little shortcuts to make things easier. So instead of saying add negative this, add negative that, we can we have this little guy right here. This means subtract immediate. All right, let me drag that up here does the same thing as above. All right, it just does R30 minus 12, put the result in R4. Easy to do. Okay, now you got some basic integer ASM stuff out the way. You understand how destination registers can be erased and whatnot. And you understand about values, values in registers. Let's talk about the one instruction you will use the most. All right. And that is load immediate. More quite more explanation points. This is very important. This instruction is very simple. Let's say we have I don't know. Mm, let's do something a little different. What's on the tutorial? See, big number, right? So I want to put it in hex. Okay, L I R twelve. Boom. Load immediate. R12 with this value. All this does, this is a simplified mnemonic. It's a standard mnemonic of an add immediate instruction that's been modified. So it's a simplified mnemonic. And all this does is it sets the value of R12 to 5000 hex. No addition is done. No other registers are involved. Nothing. So I'm going to take this just to show you what it does. Put in our handy dandy compiler. Just step once to get out over there. Okay, so check out the value in R12. Okay? You see it? It's a big number 80, 24, 27, 20, right? Now watch what happens. Boom, 5,000 hex. Simple to do, right? Right. And a little FYI, when you see these gigantic numbers, like 83, 888, 880, and number like down here in R28 or R1, those are actually representing memory addresses. And obviously with those, you can tell they're representing static memory addresses. Something like this in R6 or R4, that's just representing an integer value or just some other value for some other purpose. Does that make sense? All right, so now that you understand that, let's go back to our little tutorial. I got so many tabs open. Okay. A uh, special note about R0. Um, R0 has some weird perks to it. Um, but to understand it, let's, let's actually, I'll need to copy paste. So what is this simplified mnemonic? What does it stand for? It actually stands for this. Now, you're thinking, how can you put a zero there when a source register is there? Well, if you change this to R0, PowerPC and Broadway, and uh, they read R0 in certain instructions, not all, but instruction like add immediate, R0 is treated by the Wii CPU as zero. Obviously, all ASM compilers know this too. So this is just simply zero. So this is the simplified mnemonic. This is the standard mnemonic. But you don't ever have to worry about the standard mnemonic. It's just so much easier to type load immediate. 
Okay, so just understand that R0 equals weird. And certain instructions like add immediate, subtract immediate, and some other instructions we'll talk about later, it is treated as zero in, I would say, some instructions. Not half or more, just some. So only use R0 if you know it's not going to be treated by zero by the compiler. Just an FYI. Okay, now this little doohickey right here. Let's go over another basic instruction. Now this is a little bit more or less basic. So what this does is it takes the value R4 and the value R30, adds together and puts the result back in R4. So if R4 was this, all right, and R30, we'll put it like that. I don't need to run Dolphin again. I think you guys get the idea. So let's say we had this instruction before it gets executed this is before right once it gets executed R4 is now that okay easy to understand so this is how you can utilize have the same register for the destination register and a source register okay easy to understand writing multiple instructions in the compiler when you write instructions in the compiler we'll bring ASM we already up since this is what you're really working on Let's just throw in some instructions. Uh, just some random crap. Each instruction takes one row. You cannot do something like this. Don't do something like this. That's not going to work. One instruction per row. Easy to understand. Follow the format. Um, like I said, you don't have to add spaces. You can have these all spaces removed. But then it starts to look cluttered. I like having the spaces. The one thing, though, you need a space. You cannot have this closed off. You need a space between the instruction, or the operand, if you want to call it, <clears throat> and the R, whatever you're using. So, easy to understand, right? Okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we're going to talk about store load. Take a break gather your thoughts. I'm going to fill up some water really quick so I'll be right back like 20 seconds. Alright. Store word. Okay, so remember that relationship I talked about? How the CPU, the registers can communicate with memory or whatnot? Because on the game side, you have memory. On the CPU side, you have the registers. Right? Right. Okay. So let's just talk about a basic store word. Store word. Okay. Store the word. RD, comma, value RA. Value is sign. For any storing instruction, this is really critical to understand because this can jack you up a bit. They are not logical. They are signs. So remember that range I talked about for the 16-bit value range for sign numbers. <clears throat> Alright, so what does this do? Okay, whatever value is in RD, okay, this value gets copied from a register and gets placed in the memory. And these two elements of the instruction will tell you what memory address it's going to get copied to. This is how this is what I talked about how the CPU can interact with memory and whatnot. So to figure out the memory address that's going to get whoops. So how do you figure out the exact memory address that this word is going to be copied from the register and written to memory? Well, simple. Take value, whatever value is, the 16-bit sign value, and then add whatever value is in RA. This is known as the effective effective address, which will sometimes be abbreviated EA in different assembly manuals and PDF files and whatnot, but just understand that's what EA stands for. Um, let's see. Store. We'll just make something up. Boom. Okay, so what does this mean? 
the word. Remember what we talked about the word. The entire data of the register. Remember I talked about tell me what the word of R12 is. Tell me what the half word of R12 is. Tell me what the byte of R12 is. So now we're working with R3. So now I need so you do the word, the entire data length of the whole register of register 3. This will be copied over to the memory address value calculated what's an R31 plus hex in 20. Okay, so let's demonstrate that so you get an idea. And I think a lot of you guys who are stuck on ASM are really going to get that light bulb moment right now. We'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Now here's our 31's value. Okay. Now let me bring up Dolphin Memory Engine because this is this is really critical. Let me find. There we go. So here we go. Put that there. Okay. So we know we know R31 equals this. And kind of convenient that how that's the very beginning of memory, the start of static memory. And we know value equals this. If you add those two together, the effective address equals that. Simple enough. Now let's show you what happens. Now, remember the word. Here's R3. I plugged in a random value, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Put a little zero here. So we're dealing with the entire word of the register. Okay. Now, check this out. Let me go get Python up. Store the word R3. Type this in. Take this. We'll plug it in Dolphin. Let me just go back here. Replace instruction. Okay, and we see it. It's read it. It's put it in. And this is very important. This is why another reason you want to have all these tabs up at the same time: your registers tab, your code tab, your breakpoint tab, and Dolphin Memory Engine all alongside. Now check out this value right here. Check out the word value. Watch carefully. Here we go. In three, two, one, go. You see that? Boom, look, memory address 8000020123456678. And it still remains in R3. So it's a copy and paste. It is not a cut and paste. Make sense? Okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So let's pretend, just for reference, we're dealing with store the half word. Remember what I told you? Have different than memory. Sorry about that. We do a little bit different in memory. The half word would equal this. So if we were to do that, let's say we executed that same instruction again. If we stored the half word, it would actually, if we if we executed the instruction again, what would happen is this. Because this other portion of memory is not going to be affected because we're just storing a half word. So understand that when we're talking about values, compiled values in memory, like we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, if we're talking about memory, half word is this, byte is this. But if we're talking about registers, half word is this, byte is that. Okay. And then store byte would be like storing the byte. So you have store byte, store half word, store word. Okay, easy enough. Okay, so now what load word and zero? Let me control cut paste. Load word and zero. Let's just. Sorry about that, guys. I got certain hotkeys and whatnot. And it is what it is. Okay, so this is just the opposite. Now we talked about the interaction between the, the CPU with the registers and the game and memory. We already talked about copying stuff from the registers to memory. Now we're just going to do the reverse. We're going to copy data from memory and put it in the registers. Okay, so what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, first, it's like the same concept as store word. What we're going to do first is a little different. You're going to take the offset. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention that. 
the value here is also called the offset. Some coders will call it the offset. Some people have special names for it. Most of the time, it's called the offset. Now, we have something a little different. We have a zero here, which can also be represented if you typed it like this or like that, same thing. But since, since it's zero, we can just leave it at decimal. So to make the effective address, aka EA, you take what's an R3 and then add zero. So essentially, all this means is R3 is the EA, the effective address. So we could do R3 equals that. Now, let's just plug that in. Let me type that in the compiler. Okay, so we have this set up. We have our R3 value to 8000020. All right, the offset is zero, so the effective address is whatever is in R3, which we just mentioned. Now take a look at R31. We're just gonna put some random values in it. <clears throat> okay, now check out what happens in a load word instruction. This is different than the other instructions. Uh, this is different than the store word instruction. Okay, so. Let's get Dolphin Memory Engine. Okay, so look at the value. Remember, this is the effective address we just you put in R3. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now keep your eye on this guy, R31. You ready? In three, two, one, boom. See what happens? Whatever was in R31 just got completely obliter obliterated, gone, erased. And look, see? You copy it from memory to the registers. And obviously you can have ones like load half word and load byte. Load half word zero for half words, load byte and zero for bytes. Pretty simple. Okay. Wow, we covered a lot already. Okay, next important tip, super critical. Get a sip of water. Where's my water? Okay, so you're probably wondering at this point, Okay, Vega, that's all great and all, but what happens if I want to be able to write an entire value to a register? Like, let's say I want to write a static memory address to a register from scratch with just instructions because you can't just edit Dolphin while you're playing the game like that. Okay, simple enough. Now, remember the load immediate instruction we had? We're going to have something a little different. Load immediate shifted. Okay, so let's say we want register 20 to equal this right so we start off with one so we start off with one instruction first what we do in this is we're going to write the upper 16 bits remember how the register is an entire 32 bits this is the upper 16 bits this is the lower 16 bits so if someone says what's the upper half word or the upper 16 bits of r22 you're like oh that's 80 uh, E6. And obviously if they say, what's the half word? Well, that's FF30. But here are the instructions to make it happen. First is load immediate shifted. Okay, so, whoops. So this LIS is like this. Logical. <clears throat> Notice how we exceeded the 7 FFF limit so LIS is logical. The reason being is that I'm not going to really cover this too much, but LIS is the simplified mnemonic of this at immediate shift. But we're not going to cover that because that can be a little confusing. And you won't really use it that much in basic codes. So we just deal with load immediate shifted. Pretty simple, right? So once you execute this one instruction, if you're writing it in the compiler, it would do this instruction first. And remember how I talked about each row, each line you write in the compiler is one instruction. So if you want the next instruction to execute, we have this other instruction. Now what is this instruction? This is 
whoops, or immediate. It's since you guys are beginners, we're not going to talk about logical calculations, logical work with what's known as anding, XORing, ORing, and stuff like that. Just know that if you want to set a register to an entire word, custom word value, just put these two instructions. So if you wanted R22, 22, 22, 22. If you want R3 to be this value, R3, R3, and put it to R3, okay? Pretty simple, right? So once you execute these two instructions, whoops, E6, FF30. I'm not going to bother putting it in the dolphin to run it because we're only affecting one register. We're not affecting any other registers when we do this, obviously. But just know this is, these are two instructions you would write to write in a whole custom word value to a register. Okay. So what happens? Let's say we have a task. What's our task? Make R20. Okay, how about this? Make address. Enter in. This is our task. Make address equal. How do we do that? We want this address to equal that. Well, first, let's just pretend we're not bounded by any register rules because there are register rules we'll have to follow in the future. But for now, we'll just use R3 as the example. Okay? So f let's say this is the task. You need this memory address to equal this value. You have no registers that already equal this value and you have nowhere in memory that also equals this value. You gotta do everything from scratch. Let's just, we can do whatever registers we want, but this is how you would do it. Well first, we can set R3 to this value. So now R3 equals this. All right, it represents a memory address. All right, remember, one line per instruction. Now, let's write the value we want to memory. Great, great. So now, R3 equals this, our memory address, and R4 equals that. Now, remember the instruction we use to copy it to memory. Because we're, we're, remember, we're using the whole word, so we use store word. R4 contains the word. Since R3 contains our exact effective address, our offset for the store word instruction is zero. So this is how you would do it. Our task, make address blah 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 equal this. Boom. Simple enough? Okay. Now let's go to chapter seven, branch compare instructions. Those symbols I talked about earlier, you're gonna use them a little bit more. Branch, zero, eight, oop. We don't need that. We don't need that. Li r three one store r three blah 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 blah. Okay, so what does this guy do? Branch, branch. What does it mean? Branch. What does branching do? Okay, first it means it stands for an unconditional branch. Unconditional branch means it executes a jump or a skip, regardless of what the conditions are at that time, if you will. This jump will always be executed no matter what. Okay, so the CPU executes one instruction at a time going downward. Right? Now there's exceptions to this rule, obviously, very obviously. But let's just say for now this is what you understand. You're going down a list of instructions. You hit this guy. <clears throat> what this guy does is it'll skip. Now each member, each instruction takes a word in length. Right? So this guy is a word in length. This guy is a word in length in compiled form. Okay? So branch 8. This is 4, amount of 4, 8. So when this gets executed, this guy skips the load immediate instruction and goes here. So this instruction never gets executed. Now there's some things you're wondering. Okay, well this offset amount, if you will, this amount we put next to the branch instruction, that's going to be a pain to calculate. And then also, um, why would you just jump over random instructions, which we'll cover um, later on. So to make this way less painful, we use label names. 
All right, so a label name is basically anything you want to write. I would, it just represents a name. Uh, you, what you do is, the you can put something like this: branch the label. I, I like to use underscores in my label names, so I know their label names if I have a bunch of junk, you know, in my source or whatnot. Um, I don't recommend putting any special symbols. Don't put numbers really. Uh, just for the base, for the time being, just use some words with the underscore. Just keep it simple. So, remember we talked about it branches right to here. So now all you have to do, put that label name again, the label, but this time put a colon. So, I like to have spaces just so things keep organized. This is the exact same as this. See how much easier it is? You can just write that and you got that right there. Because what happens if you have to branch like a hundred, like amount of hundred in hex, or a, weird, a really odd number, or maybe you have to branch backwards? It would be a pain to do this calculation with the numbers, just easier to do the label names. All compilers are configured to accept these label names, easy to do. Okay, let's talk about conditional branching now. Remember, why would we just branch over random construct, uh, instructions? So let's go um, into conditional branching. This will imagine it like a a road of traffic. You can create a fork in this road. And depending on what the conditions are, you go one way down the fork and one down the other, if you will. And then later the fork converges back to the main road of traffic. That makes any sense. So B and E. We'll just use our same label name as earlier. We'll just do something like that. Put our thing like that. Store word R30. Let's put like R8. It doesn't really matter what we use. We're just looking at basic format. Okay, so branch if not equal. Okay, well, what do we mean by branch if not equal? That doesn't make sense. This seems like an if, like we're branching due to like an if statement. Well, if that's the case, you need to create this if statement. How do we create this if statement? Well, in order to create this if statement, we use compare word instructions. You'll have two kind, essentially. You have compare word immediate and compare word. <clears throat> compare word immediate is what you're going to be using the most. Compare word. Uh, I don't know what. We'll just do R10. Zero times A. <clears throat> so remember, each instruction from top to bottom, essentially, when this gets executed, compare the word to R10 to A. So let's pretend R10 equals 0, which means it's not A. It's not 10 or whatever. So if this instruction was to execute, compare to R10, branch if not equal. Well, it would take the branch because R10 is not equal to A. So it goes hit here, hit here. It's not equal. We skip down and execute that. Now what happens if it was equal to A? click here it is equal to a now remember this is a not equal branch so it's not actually this is not a true it's not a true statement that's not equal because it is equal so therefore it just goes down right to the next instruction these aren't really you can treat them as barriers but they're only barriers depending on the condition if the condition isn't met it just goes right through this barrier and goes to the next instruction the load immediate and then goes right down to the next instruction top to bottom okay and we also have branch if equal, the exact opposite. So if we run this, boom, the label name gets taken because R10 is equal to A, branch if equal. So just understand that. B and E equals branch if not equal. B E Q equals branch if equal. You can say skip, jump, but coders like to use the term branch. Easy, easy to understand. Okay, so let's look at a little more complex scenario. Okay, here we go. Let me take a sip of water. We got a branch of equal. We know what that does. We know what the compare instructions do. We have all this. But you're probably wondering, why is this guy here? All right, now, think of it like this. Let's just go over it one at a time. Let's say R10 is equal to 0xA, or A in hex. We do the check. 
R10 is equal to A. We check it, it is equal to A, we branch. We skip the load immediate. We skip this branch right here, this other label name, and we go right here. We execute this instruction and we go straight down to this one. Now, that's what would happen. Okay, we skipped two instructions if R10 was equal to A. Let's pretend if R10 was not equal to A. Let's just say it has a value of like 22. We execute, we do the check. After we do a check, it's not equal. So we do not take the conditional branch. We go straight down, load immediate. Now, then we hit this branch. Why would we do this? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? If R10 was A, we want this instruction to execute. If it's not A, we don't want this instruction right here to execute. So we have to put an unconditional branch to skip this guy because we're not equal to A. So we branch to the end, the end, boom. So only one instruction gets executed. That makes sense? Because if we didn't have this branch guy here, what's the point of even doing the check? Because this is going to get executed no matter what. Okay, there we go. And then we have um, compare word. Compare word is like, you just compare two registers. And one thing I need, uh, forgot to mention is that when we're talking about compare word immediate and compare word, the values in the registers are signed and they're compared as signed values. We're not going to talk about any logical comparisons. Those are kind of for intermediate level coders. But for beginners, all your comparisons are going to be done as signed values. So we have something like this. Now, there, now I also provided this, a listing of basic branches you'll use when you're a basic coder. So we have branch of equal, branch of not equal, branch of greater than. So if we have branch of greater than. Now th when we do in these branches, they, they read from left to right. So if R4 equals 2, R8 equals 4, this branch, um, excuse me, let me fix that, the label. This branch will not be taken because R2, 2 is not greater than 4. Even if they're equal, it still wouldn't be taken. The only way this would be taken is if R4 is greater than R8. So 5 or more is the only way this branch will be taken. Simple enough. And like I said, you can do branch of less than, branch of greater than or equal to, branch of less than or equal to. You got so many options. And this is just a little handy thing. Remember, you obviously already understand this. Store instructions copy from the CPU. They get written to memory. Load instructions get copied from the memory and they overwrite what are in the whatever registers you are working with. Add, subtract, multiply, branching and comparison, stuff like that. They stay within the CPU itself. Memory does not get affected. Okay. Then we have some extra stuff here. I mean, I'm not really gonna cover this. It's just random stuff. You can put label names for actual values. Nothing really important. And then we you can give branch hints. Like if you're writing a code and like you know chances are as a higher as a greater than a half of a chance or 50% chance to be like not equal, you could put a BNE plus. Um, if the chance is like less than 50% and you know for certain it will be you put a minus. So a plus is more likely the conditional branch will be taken. Uh, a minus is less likely that conditional branch will be taken. Uh, if you're a beginner coder, don't even worry about it. It doesn't even matter. Um, there's stuff in the CPU itself to do all this branch guesswork for you, but if you get really nitpicky and we just want to put it just because obviously conditional branches cannot do plus or minus. I mean unconditional branches. Unconditional branches cannot do it because they're unconditional. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. They're going to get the instruction. It's going to jump to that label no matter what. And one of the most important other symbols you will use is hashtags. Like for example, if you're writing a gigantic source and you have an instruction, you know what it's for. Let's just say this is a character value. Set character value. That way you can go back to your source and view, okay, why did I do this load immediate R5, put the value of 1? Oh, I'm setting a character value. Compilers are configured that once they read this, they disregard all this so it doesn't read this as an instruction. Simple do. You can also put stuff like this in its own line just to put stuff here, just like notes and stuff like that. And um, the one thing about WeRD, though, is that if you're writing like something like this, 
and you go to like the new uh, next line, it'll try to read it as an instruction. That's the downfall of WeRDGUI. The py this Python compiler doesn't have a problem. So even if you do get WeRDGUI working, like I talked about in episode six, you might just want to go ahead and install the Python one. And then that's pretty much it, guys. Um, chapter 10, conclusions and credits, blah, blah, blah. And this link right here, I can go over it. Um, I can go over it right now. So this is just a simple ASM reference page because what I noticed when I looked up ASM, ha ASM handbooks and PDF files and the IBM website, they did a pretty, they're designed to help other developers. They're not designed to help noobs like a person who could be viewing this right now. So I just have a bunch of instructions with the, the format, the syntax, if you will, whether or not value is signed. I provide all sorts of examples. So you don't have to read this. It's just view this for you. Maybe instructions you don't know existed that you may need to use. You can understand how they work. The more, the less common an instruction is used on average in an MKE code, the further you know, the further down the list it will be. Not exactly. It's not exact science. It's just generally speaking, some of these instructions like shift right word immediate are rarely used in most MKE codes, so it's towards the bottom. <clears throat> All right. Excuse me. And that is pretty much it. Okay, so for episode 8, we will go to chapter 7 and actually create a code. And we'll do it on Alt WFC live in action. I may be able to do this later tonight, or you might have to hold off till tomorrow. But I would say just take a lot of time to view this video. Play around with Dolphin. Play around with the registers. Um, if you have Python compiler up and you get, got it, you can use the raw ASM code type right here. To compute raw instructions and replace them in the code view and execute them and play around, um, just you just got to start just fiddling stuff, uh, fiddling uh, with stuff on your own to really learn. Um, and that is pretty much it, guys. I really appreciate you guys watching all my videos. I know this is highly requested. Hopefully, that um, store word and load word representation, that visualization, will help you guys a lot. All right, guys. Thanks for watching.